All right, what we're going to talk about today is Unit 2, which is Better Living Through Agnes Science. All right, this ties in with Chapter 2 in the textbook, but I'm going to kind of hit some high points here that you need to understand. So. Now, people have different variety of living conditions that they live in. Uh, part of it is what their home is like, their quality of their home. There are people that live literally with nothing. They sleep where they're at. Uh, they got blanket, maybe, and that's how they live. Then there's other people live in billion dollar mansions. Uh, so different people live in different ways. Uh, so the quality of the home variety varies for a lot of people. The food that they eat varies. Some people eat what they find. Some people eat roadkill. Some people eat what they dig out of the dumpster. Other people have their own personal chef to make sure that they're fed three times a day with whatever it is that they want. So when it comes time, comes down to it, there's a very large difference in the variety of living conditions. Families are all different. Everybody's family is different. Some people's families have 20 people. Some people's families have two. Some people's families have one. Uh, so we have different variety, a diverse variety of living conditions out there. Uh, neighborhoods and communities are all different. We can have different, com your community and my community might be different. We have rural communities. We have urban communities. We have different neighborhoods. You might live in a subdivision. You might live on a trailer all by yourself down at the end of a woods road. So it's all different. Climates and topography. Climate is your weather conditions, your yearly weather conditions. Uh, you might live on top of a mountain. You might live in the tropics. You might live in a subtropical region like Louisiana. Topography is the geography as well as the plants and things that grow on it. The topography of Louisiana is mostly swamps, whereas the topography of Colorado is mountains. But a lot of Colorado is actually prairies, and people don't even think about that. All right. So we have lots of factors that influencing living environments. And there's lots of different factors that do influence how environments people live in. Humans' interaction with animals is different from environment to environment. Some places animals are pests or predator, and other environments are predators. Some places they come in and eat your garden. Some places they eat your garbage. Uh, sometimes they eat you. And humans and animals have different interactions. But it's not all animals are pests either. A lot of animals are different things. Uh, your pet dog is your pet. That's a different interaction than if you live in Africa and a lion's trying to eat you. So. Insects influence us differently as well. Insects can have a good influence. Insects can have a bad influence. Some insects carry diseases. Uh, you might have seen some giant grasshoppers running around outside right now. Uh, those are called locusts. And in general, locusts are not good from an agricultural standpoint. Uh, you probably remember in American history, the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, one of the reason, big contributing factors to the Great Depression was the fact that we had a Dust Bowl in the major ag producers of the United States along the Great, the Great Plains, Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, Iowa, they had a very bad drought to where a lot of their topsoil dried up and blew away. Well, their plants that didn't make it because of the drought, also probably the ones that survived, there was hordes of locusts that landed on these crops and ate everything that was left. So that's a case where plants where insects weren't valuable to our agricultural system. But there are times where plants or animals are very, or insects, where insects are very beneficial to our agricultural system. Uh, the bee movie, you've all seen it. And you all know that plants, that flowers can't grow without bees to pollinate them. That's a place where insects are beneficial. People using bees to get their honey, that's another place where insects are beneficial. Chemicals. Chemicals can be, infl can be beneficial or not beneficial. Uh, example of chemicals being beneficial is fertilizers. 
we plant we put fertilizers on our uh put fertilizer on our crops and our crops end up doing better and yielding more uh example of a chemical that's not good is ddt ddt was a great insect killer problem was it killed everything else too so in the 70s they actually banned it but it was designed to kill insects and it did a great job later we'll talk about the aerosol can the aerosol can was actually designed during world war ii to send out ddt to kill mosquitoes from malaria Scroll down here a little bit. All right. We live on a planet. Humans, animals, and plants all share a living environment. We're all living organisms. In reality, humans could be lumped under animals, but because we're so much different, we usually break it down into three parts. Excessive populations of humans can damage plants. It can also damage animals. It can also take away key habitat. Anybody here who's had Hunter Ed knows that the number one threat to wildlife in the world is loss of habitat. So excessive population of humans can lead to other species not being successful. Uh, humans are the only organisms that are able to improve their own living environments. Other organisms live in the environment that they're in. Humans can genetically engineer and modify the environment they live in. Think about the population of Louisiana. Do you think there'd be as many people living in Louisiana as they do if it wasn't for air conditioning? I can guarantee you I would not be one of them. I would live somewhere else where it wasn't so stinking hot. All right, animals, same thing. Too many animals can damage plants in high numbers. They can compete with humans. Uh, Plants are generally beneficial. If you remember back to life science, you remember the photosynthesis equation where plants take sunlight and carbon dioxide and they produce sugar and water. Well, plants are beneficial to animals because what animals do is they take sugar and water and then they break it down and they, or they take sugar they take sugar and break it down to get energy, and then they give off water and carbon dioxide. So it's a big cycle, and that helps to uh, take care of. It's a big cycle, and we keep that thing going around. So in general, those plants can be beneficial. All right, agri-science in the growing world. Agri-science in the growing world is very important. Uh, the science of ag science is still the science of food production, processing, and distribution. How are we going to feed the people on this planet? Ag science holds the keys to the prosperous future of the United States. About 20% of the jobs in the United States relate directly towards the food supply. I have seen st statistics as high as like 80% of jobs are ag related. Now, that includes medicine and things like that, and it's kind of a stretch in my opinion, but uh, most of the jobs in the world revolve around feeding people, and if nothing else, you can make the argument that 100% of the jobs in the world involve feeding people because people work because people got to eat. Uh, so because of all these changes in egg science, it's actually led to higher paying jobs and it's led to higher standards of living. People are making more money because of ag science. All right, world population trends. And I'm gonna explain this here in a second. Give me one second, I gotta draw or figure out if my drawings are correct. All right, they're what I want them to be. So uh, the world is generally getting a greater population there's more people being born than are dying. All right. Adults are living longer. The largest group in the world is actually under the age of 25 population wise. And the other thing is too, people are living much longer. People are living much longer than they used to. The average lifespan has gone up dramatically. 
200 years ago, somebody my age closing in on 50 was an old man. Now 50 is really middle age. It's not unheard of to know, hear somebody or know somebody that lives to be a hundred. So because of that population is going up and all those people are eating something. So what I want to explain to you now is these. Let me switch my pointer. I'll use the pen because it's a little easier to see it. All right. This is a pyramidal shaped population graph. What that means is this is the people being born in a year. This is the people dying in a year. If you're under a pyramidal shaped population graph, you've got more people being born than are dying. That's a problem because it's a growth population. That means these people are going to be making more and more and more. And these people, you got to, this group of people has to feed this group of people. So it can be an issue. This is an inverted pyramid. What that means is it's a pyramid turned upside down. There's not as many people being born as are dying. This is a problem because this is a population that's in decline. It cannot sustain a population following a graph that looks like this. This is a tree shaped. Tree shaped is also called a Christmas tree shaped. Down here, you have a certain number of people live being born and somewhere about here you have a certain number of people that are dying all right but in between here you've got a bump for some reason that has caused the population to really swell in a certain area but generally it's kind of the same throughout the entire column now this over here is what is called a baby boom all right You've got a certain amount of people born. You've got a certain amount of people die, and they're generally about the same. But then in the center, you've got a big swell. The United States population went through this, except now our population looks like this. Because the baby boom of World War II, these people that were born during this baby boom have died or are dying. There's still another large population there, but in general, population in the United States, these people have realized they can't continue to have families with 15 people, and they've cut back to having two kids. So the population has actually become a little more stable. Then finally, the last one's what's called a columnar distribution or uh, population. That means that just as many people are being born as are dying. That's a stable population. That's not a growth population. So what's all these population things mean? This, the people here raising the food can feed these people and these people because there's the same amount of people. This population's growing out. You're going to have extra food here because you don't have many people eating it. This, you're not going to have enough food because you got more people eating than you got producing. And you'll see bumps from time to time, but a stable population should be close to a kilometer distribution. So different developed countries have different world population trends. Honduras actually has a pyramid shaped uh, population. Canada's got a Christmas tree. That's about what the United States has. Sweden is, Sweden is more columnar. Just about as many people are born in Sweden as die in Sweden. Now, next section in the textbook is agri-science developments, agriculture engineering. And they talk a large part here about inventors. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and read all these to you, but some of these you learned about in history class. McCormick invented the reaper, which allowed people to pick corn uh, without having to pick individual ears. They could run a machine through their field and pick the corn, allowed them to pick corn a lot faster. Uh, Eli Jen Whitney invented the cotton gin, and Eli Whitney also invented the concept of interchangeable parts, so you could take one part from one thing and bolt it on to something else. So these were all revolutionary uh, inventions as far as agriculture. 
And the way agriculture goes, the country went. When you can feed more people more quickly, you can go out and do other stuff. Ag engineering made a huge difference in the population of America and cell in America. Uh, first thing, one of the big things was getting electricity to rural farms. So instead of having to go to bed at night and when it got dark and get up in the morning when the light came up and work when there was light and sleep when it was dark, it allowed us to do other things. It allowed farmers to stay up a little later and study. It allowed farmers to have entertainment. It allowed people countrywide to have access to entertainment. Uh, and allowed the farmer to become more efficient in what it is that he did. Machinery companies. You had these different agricultural machinery companies pop up like John Deere, who back there in the inventions, one of the things that they didn't talk about was John Deere, which kind of amazed me because John Deere is a company that is still in existence. John Deere invented the steel scouring plow. He didn't just invent the steel plow, he invented the steel scouring plow. Because the problem with the steel plow was, steel plow was great because it allowed you to plow rocky soil that you couldn't do with a wooden plow, but stuff would stick to it. The scouring plow would, was self-cleaning, so you could just put it in the ground and go. That was invented by John Deere. The same company that still makes bright green tractors was that John Deere company. Uh, you had Case International Harvester, you had Farm All, you had Oliver, you had all kinds of different farm machinery companies. And you still to this day have different ones. Uh, something else that's made a huge difference is mechanization of underdeveloped countries. Instead of using a ox to plow your field, now you can get a tractor. Ox gets tired, ox got to take a break. You can only go as fast as the ox can go. With a tractor, tractor doesn't get tired tractor you just put more fuel in and you can continue doing what it is that you were doing now some other big developments for agri-science were in the realm of the plants and the animals the earliest days of agriculture was basically like you in a garden today you took a shovel you took a stick you took something you loosened up the soil you threw some seeds in there you kept the animals away from it from eating it and then you ended up with a crop, hopefully. Well, mechanization of agriculture allowed you to multiply what you were doing on a much larger scale and made you be more efficient. Because of that, mechanization contributed to much larger farms throughout the United States. This freed people up to learn other trades, it allowed people to do different things, learn, it allowed people to become the village blacksmith who would help to make parts and machines so that people could live better with machines, uh, allowed people to go into government. It allowed people to go into law enforcement. They weren't entirely dependent on somebody at, on making sure they had enough food to make it through the winter. They had different foods, to, food sources. Uh, and really as far as growth goes, that's what, the real benefit was behind agricultural mechanization. Oh shoot, I think I lost it. All right, some other big developments in ag research was the multi-use peanut. Everybody here has heard of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver discovered many, many different ways to use a peanut, like 80 different ways, 80 different things you could make from a peanut. Uh, we learned about soybeans and how versatile soybeans were. You probably don't think you've ever eaten a soybean, but you probably have. If you've ever eaten an Incredible Whopper, they're full of soybeans. Uh, a lot, if you've ever eaten a school hamburger, you've eaten soybeans. Soybeans can be used as a protein rich source of filler for people to eat. They've got a lot of protein in them. Uh, on pound for pound, they have more protein than beef. Uh, Soybeans are used in animal feed. They're used in your cat's food. They're used in your dog food. Soybeans are everywhere. If you've ever eaten edamame, those are soybeans. Uh, if you've ever eaten tofu, that is a version of soybeans. Uh, baked potatoes, larger non-mealy baked potatoes, that is a product of agricultural research. 
as I said earlier, aerosol cans, WD-40, any kind of spray paint, traces its lineage back to World War II when they put DDT in spray cans so that the guys who were fighting in the South Pacific could kill the mosquitoes around them so they didn't get malaria so they could keep fighting. Breeding a smaller family turkey. A 30 pound turkey doesn't make much sense if you're a family of four. So breeding a smaller turkey was important. The Green Revolution brought us sustainable agriculture. Can we continue to do this stuff year in and year out? Or are we gonna deplete the soil? What can we do to produce more with the same soil? Uh, blueberry cult cultivated blueberries. You didn't have farm blueberries 50 years ago. If you wanted blueberries, you went out on the mountain and picked them. Uh, now we can have blueberry farms where we can get farm blueberries any time of the year. That is a product of ag research. Nutritional values of food. Food has become much more nutritionally diverse. And because of that, the nutritional diversity has actually made a lot of the nutrient density of the food go up. So the food has more calories on a per pound basis. That was done through ag, ag research. Biological attractants, these are used, Bob, stop. Biological attractants, these were used to help, uh, we can use these in traps, to trap pests. Uh, that's really what a lot of this is used for. If you have a specific species of insect you don't want in your field, you can put out traps with a biological attractant that will lure them in and it will catch them. Uh, if you've ever seen a gypsy moth trap, that uses biological attractants. If you're having a raccoon problem, there are biologically engineered raccoon attractants that you can trap raccoons with. All the reality is a peanut butter and a big fatty marshmallow is still the best thing to catch a coon. So, other breakthroughs, rot resistant tomatoes. So your tomatoes last longer and they don't turn black. Natural rubber production. This is amazing to me. A lot of the rubber that you get in the United States is actually domestically produced. It comes from a bush that looks like a sagebrush. Have you ever seen an old Western cartoon where a tumbleweed goes drifting by? That's a sagebrush. It's an old dead, dried out sagebrush, but it's a sagebrush. They have genetically modified some of these sagebrush to be able to produce rubber. So we actually have domestic rubber production in the United States. Before that, if we needed rubber for tires, we had to get it from India. Bioengineered designer foods. Uh, the grapple is a good example of this, if you've ever had one. It's an apple that tastes like grapes. They have one that tastes like grapes and they have one that tastes like cotton candy. That's a bioengineered food. How they got DNA to bioengineer a cotton candy apple, I don't know, but it exists. Monoclonal antibodies in goat's milk. This is actually in a, a goat milk that contains antibiotics. So if you have an infant that needs antibiotics, you can give them this goat's milk and it contains antibiotics. Taking animal fat from after animals have been slaughtered and instead of throwing that fat away, turn it into biodiesel to run vehicles. That's another breakthrough in agri-science. Mastitis reducing dairy cows. Mastitis is an infection that dairy cows get that causes them to dry up. They don't give milk. And by reducing mastitis, you can actually keep the yield of the cow better and you make more money because you have more milk to sell. Controlling fire ants is another breakthrough in agri-science. Uh, one of the cool things about fire ants is when you use the conventional fire ant poison that we all use and we all buy at the dollar store, that doesn't kill anything. That actually makes the fire ants want to leave. So all we do in Louisiana with our fire ants is chase them from our, our yard to our neighbor's yard. So our neighbor decides to chase them back to our yard. Fire ant control, they have biological fire ant control that they're working on developing where these fire ants will actually, with this poison, die. So 
coxidosis control. Coxidosis is a bacterial infection uh, that animals get, and we can use use different biological conditions to take care of that. Exotic flowers, breed, more breeds of flowers, or changing breeds of flowers. And pink roses, you can grow them. Purple roses, you can grow them. Those don't exist naturally, but they've crossbred them to where you can get them. Satellites and nitrogen gas lasers. We can look at crop, crop fields using satellites to identify the, the nutrient requirements of those different fields. And finally, sugar beets and rice hybrids. At one time, Louisiana was the nation's largest producer of sugar. At one time, Louisiana was the largest mm -hmm. producer of sugar. Uh, not anymore. We're actually outproduced in sugar by Iowa. Or no, Iowa, it's not Idaho. Sugar beet uh, makes, we take cane, or they took the DNA from cane, and they engineered it into these regular old beets that are sugar beets. Yeah. And they make sugar from there. So. All right. Hope you enjoyed. No. Oh, wait, one more section. Uh, yes. Agri-science in the future. Agri-science is of growing importance in the next 100 years because world population could be continuing to increase. World population right now is like 6.7 or 6.8 billion people. There's a bunch of people out there. And we're going to have to feed all those people. So ag science is going to have to progress. America is now in the international arena as far as being the driving force in agriculture. What we do in the United States is what gets done worldwide. Uh, our new challenges are going to be the international business economy. Our main export partner is China. Agriculture depends on our relationship with China, pure, pure and simple. Uh Bigger, the biggest markets are becoming competitors. We're now in competition with Canada. Canada's trying to sell their soybeans just the way the United States is. And it is competition, and that's a challenge. Farming has been mandated to become more efficient. There's no doubt about it. Without a, us becoming more efficient, uh, without us becoming more efficient, we're not going to be able to feed to 6.8 billion people. So and scientific improvements are needed in animal agriculture because right now i think i saw a statistic that for every one deer in the united states there's three dairy cows or three cows either dairy or beef we need to feed all those animals and we need to become more efficient in that whole process all right so if you have any questions you know how to get a hold of me have a good evening all right bye